Thank you, and good afternoon. So we have a lot to cover. Elon does a lot of things. Um, there is, at the moment, one of his spaceships docked to the, uh, the space station, uh, the Dragon spaceship. This is the third time uh, that it's been docked, second commercial one. It was launched last week. Uh, many of you may have followed the launch, but there was drama. You know, there were solar panels and all this kind of stuff. We could follow it on your Twitter feed. Yeah, rocket um, set drama. What's it, can you just tell us what it's like to be Elon Musk in the control room during a launch when something happens, when there's an issue? Uh, well, it's, uh, I mean, it's extremely nerve-wracking. I mean, it's, the, the thing about rocket launch is that all of your work is distilled into these few minutes, particularly the, the first several seconds around uh, the, the liftoff, because the worst thing that could happen with a rocket, in you know, touch word, is uh, if, 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 if you have an engine failure or some, some huge failure right above the launch pad, and the whole thing can come down with about a million pounds of TNT equivalent and destroy the whole launch pad. That would be, that, that, that's what's going through my mind, in case you're wondering. Uh, <laughs> that's actually what I'm thinking about. Yeah. Um, so when it clears the lightning towers and it's gotten further enough away from uh, not actually destroying the launch pad, then, I, then it's, that's one sort of could go down a notch on, on um, you know, uh, the fear and anxiety. And then after first stage separation, that's another one. And when the second stage lights up, so it's sort of you're going down um, in intensity a as the rocket is going up. Uh, and the, the thing is that the first three rocket launches that we had failed. Okay, and then the, the first one failed quite close to the launch pad, almost destroyed the launch pad. In fact, I spent that day picking up rocket pieces off the reef, uh, which, is, which sucks. So I think like, there's a pretty powerfully ingrained fear response um, as a result of that, because three in a row just, you know, and uh, the, the image of those rocket failures kind of going through my mind as I'm seeing the rocket launch. So that's what's going on. And then in this case, um, you made it through the, the stage separation, but then there was an issue with the solar cells. Um, tell me a little bit how you sort of spotted the problem, diagnosed it, what does the team do? I mean, you got there in the end, but um, how does it work? Yeah, so uh, the solar panels were actually okay, but, uh, and, and the, the rocket launch went, went really well, so that, that was not a problem. Uh, w where things kind of went awry was after spacecraft separation, we tried to initialize the four thruster pods. So there's, there's four thruster pods with a combined total of 18 engines. And uh, the, the system is designed with a huge amount of redundancy. So it can take all sorts of failures and still complete its mission. That's, that's the whole way it's been made. Um, in fact, it can, it can work with, even if it has only two of the four thruster pods working, you know, it can still comp do, do a mission. Um, so three weren't working. Wow. Um, and, uh, which was a huge puzzle, like what, why are three not working? Because these things are cross-strapped, so you'd, you'd kind of think that either maybe one wouldn't work, or a, a cross-strapped pair wouldn't work, but not three. It was really, really strange. So, um, so, so we had the spacecraft just going through kind of free drift in space, like they're just tumbling, um, and, and, and which makes it also, also difficult to, to communicate with because the antennas are like pointing you know, every which way you can imagine. So we had, all we had was, was a, a very slight two kilobit, uh, occasional two, two kilobit link that would go in and out. Um, and, and that was an omnidirectional signal beaming off the NASA TDRS satellite system. Um, so in order to actually improve the, the, we first had to improve the bandwidth. So we, we actually asked the Air Force if we could have some of their long range telemetry scanners, can, 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 would, would they give us access? And we have this um, communication system that we call the mega proxy. So we had to uh, recode the mega proxy to go through the Air Force long range dishes to, to blast the, the spacecraft with enough intensity to be able to upload new code uh, to try to fix the problem. And uh, so, so we wrote some new, some new software to um, essentially pressure slam the uh, two of the, 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 the three oxidizer tanks that were um, refusing to pressurize. Um, and it, it turned out, we've, I think we've figured out the problem, which is that there's 
a, there was a, a slight change made to a check valve that was in three of the tanks and not, and not in the other, and we were able to replicate that problem on the ground later. Um, and, and we were able to, to, to basically have the, have the system build up pressure upstream, then re release that pressure and slam the valve. Um, so we're trying to give it the sort of the spacecraft equivalent of the Heimlich maneuver, yeah. basically. Um, and, and then we got one of the pods to, that looked like it was making progress. Uh, and uh, we, we didn't want to unfurl the solar panels until we had at least two pods active. So we could, we could go from sort of drifting to, to an active hold. Uh, but then the, 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 the temperatures of the solar panels, which are in these protective covers, was dropping. Uh, and it can drop to like almost absolute zero if it's pointing in, at, at, at uh, dark space. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so it was dropping, 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 and we're like, okay, shit, we better release the solar panels. Um, otherwise, they could literally freeze in place. Um, and so we ran a simulation to see what, what, would, what would happen. Um, and it was actually slightly beneficial. And it's kind of like when a skater, you know when a skater uh, puts her arms out, yeah. um, it slows down, pull them in, it speeds up. So when, actually when the, the arms went out, when the solar panel arrays went out, it slowed down the rate of rotation. Actually slightly helped us with um, maintaining communication with the spacecraft. And um, so then we're able to, uh, with, with that pressure slam thing, get, get, a, get a pod uh, active, then a, then, then a third one, and then a fourth one. Then we got all four working, and we're able to c continue the mission Dock with the space station. In fact, the Dragon is currently docked with the space station right now. And um, if, if all goes well, we'll return uh, to Earth in about a week or two. That sounds terrifying. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. That was, that was hardcore. <laughs> I don't want to go through that again. OK. Um, you are not just here in, in, in Austin for South by Southwest, but also to meet with the Texas legislature to talk about right. possibly a launch base here in Texas. Tell us more about that. Um, yeah, so right now we've got uh, two main launch locations. One is uh, Cape Canaveral in Florida, and the other is uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. Um, and so they, uh, Cape Canaveral is good for kind of eastward launches, uh, Vandenberg for southerly launches, and we figure we need a, a third launch site that's kind of a commercial launch site. You know, it's not, because um, Cape Canaveral and Vandenberg are Air Force bases, um, which, which is cool. And it's, obviously, there's, there's an important need for Air Force space launch bases as there is for Air Force uh, airports. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's also uh, a need for commercial airports. And just like you wouldn't expect commercial airliners to land um, at uh, an Air Force base in a normal course of events, um, it makes sense to have a commercial spaceport. Um, and th we, we need to be able to launch eastward, uh, and we want to be close to the equator. Um, so that basically means uh, the, 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 the potential states are Virginia through Texas, um, going, you know, going south, uh, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico. Because the other thing is we need to stay on, on US territory mm -hmm. because um, Rocket technology like we're doing is considered an advanced weapons technology, so it's very difficult to uh, export that, if you will, to other countries. Um, and uh, anyway, so those are our options. Right, right now, Texas is arguably the leading candidate, um, but uh, we, we need certain legislation passed that's supportive of space launch. Um, I don't think it's particularly controversial, um, but one of the things we need, for example, is we need to be able to close the beach when we're doing a launch, and Texas has the Open Beaches Act. It's like, okay, you know, we, 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 we can't launch if there's someone right, right next to the rocket, you know, on the beach. Um, so that's, I don't, like I said, I don't think it's a particularly uh, controversial thing. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and, and then, and then we, we, we kind of need a little bit of protection for kind of the, the one in 10,000 person case who, who complains about the thing. Like we had this dude who filed a lawsuit against us for our rocket uh, development site in, in central Texas near Waco. He's like not even in the same county. Um, <laughs> he's in a neighboring county, and he like also thinks like the CA is listening to his brainwaves. Um, so we need like just a little bit of protection for, for people like that, so we're not like spending a ton of time in court. Um, so that's basically what we're asking for. It's nothing 
nothing major. Um, and uh, I, I think it's likely to, to move forward. So I think you know, if, 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 if things go as expected, there's, there's, it's likely that we'll have a launch site in Texas, which I think would be really cool. Around when? Um, so it's, it, it depends on how the environmental approvals go and all that. But I think, um, I think we'll, if, if things go well, I mean, not all, not all of it's in our hands. So, but assuming that things go as expected, you know, there'd be a decision this year, and then we'd start construction next year. And then and probably the first launches would take place in, uh, from there in two to three years. Terrific. Yeah. Um, so um, Falcon 9, or the, the rocket that launched a Dragon, is a traditional rocket, which is to say it's disposable bits. But right. you're, essentially, you're ultimately focused on reusable rockets. Yes, absolutely. Um, and Grasshopper is the name of that. Can you talk a little bit about what's, why reusable, what's different about reusable? And I think you probably have some things to show as well. Yeah, absolutely. So reusability is extremely important. Um, if, if you think it's important that humanity extend beyond Earth, um, and become multi-planet species and all that. Um, and, and, I mean, it, it's super important. I, thought, I think it's also incredibly obvious common sense. Like, you can imagine watching, like, Star Trek, and then they, they got a new starship after every, every trip. That would be pretty silly. Um, and, 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 and every uh, mode of transport that we're used to, like cars, planes, trains, automobiles, horses, bikes, they're all reusable, um, and, but, but not rockets. And, if, if we can't make rockets reusable, the cost is just prohibitive. Mm. The, the, uh, like the cost of the fuel and oxygen on a Falcon 9 is 0.3% of the cost of the rocket. Wow. So it's basically, it's a very tiny number. It's, it's very similar to, uh, to an airplane. So it's how much does it cost to fuel up an airplane um, and how much does it cost to buy an airplane. They're very different things. So if, if, we're, if humanity is ever to expand beyond Earth and establish a self-sustaining base on another planet, it's critical that we solve this problem. Whether it's SpaceX or someone else, someone has to solve the problem, um, and we can have a hundredfold reduction in the cost of space flight. Um, so, so that's the, what SpaceX has been trying to do. Um, and really, that's been the goal since the beginning of the company. So, so far, I've not been very successful uh, in, that, in that regard. So, but I, th I think we kind of have a handle on it. I think, I think we've got a... We've got a design that in the simulations in, and in CAD and so forth, it, it, it closes, like it should work. If we can build that thing, it should work. And uh, in fact, it may be worth just rolling the reusability video so people have a sense of what I'm talking about. I don't know where that plays, but behind us, in front of us? <laughs> Can people in the audience see that? <laughs> Oh, okay. oh, there we go. All right. All right, so what you're seeing here is that the, the first stage, uh, after stage separation, the first stage turns around, boosts back to the launch pad, um, and then lands propulsively with landing gear. It's kind of how a rocket should land. That's, that's the upper stage. This is the, this is the quick version of the video, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> and, and then you're seeing Dragon version 2. So Dragon version 2 will land on thrusters with landing gear with the ac at the, as accurately as a helicopter. So it can land anywhere on Earth as, with, with the accuracy of a helicopter. One last question about space before we turn to, to cars. Um, You've talked before about how you decided to get into this. You were, you founded, you know, co-founded uh, uh, PayPal. Um, you don't really, I mean, you have a physics degree. You know something about, about you know, the underlying mechanics, but you didn't have any space experience. Right. You decided, I think, on a train to go to Mars and decided that you could out-compete NASA, or that you could get to Mars, you could get to space faster, cheaper, better than the, one of the largest, well, the largest space agency in the world. How did you get that confidence? Uh, so, <laughs> uh, well, I think, first of all, I should say, uh, maybe give some of a preface to um, what happened before starting SpaceX. Um, in, in fact, uh, the way I sort of got into space was um, to do, I, 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 I was really disappointed that we had not sent anyone to Mars, that we had not progressed beyond Apollo. 
Um, and I kept waiting for when we would, and it just didn't happen uh, year after year. And, and so a, a friend of mine asked me about what I wanted to do after PayPal, and I said, well, you know, I was always curious about space, but I didn't think about that there was anything I could do, do in space. And, and I went to the NASA website to just see when are we going to Mars, and I couldn't find, find that out. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I thought maybe I, it was there, but I, well, hidden or something. But um, so, so, so th then I thought, well, perhaps this is a question of of will. Is there sufficient will to do this? And and the first idea I came up with was actually to do a philanthropic mission to send a small greenhouse to the surface of Mars with seeds and dehydrated gel that would hydrate upon landing and you'd have this cool greenhouse with these green plants on a red background. That would be the money shot. Um, <laughs> and, and, and then, uh, you know, the, people like precedents and superlatives. So it would be the first, the first uh, life on another planet, furthest that life's ever traveled, and, uh, and that would get people excited. And you also learn about, a lot about what it took to support earth, lands, earth plants in a greenhouse on Mars. Um, the, the, the whole purpose of that was to get people excited about sending people to Mars and increase NASA's budget. So that was my whole goal. I was going to basically torch, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it was not, had nothing to do with competing with NASA. In fact, my goal was to increase their budget. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and I should say that today, NASA is our biggest customer. Um, I mean, um, we've, we've got almost 50 launches and uh, about a quarter of those are for NASA. But three quarters, three quarters commercial, but one quarter NASA. Um, and uh, NASA's been incredibly supportive and helpful, and we wouldn't be where we are today without, without the help of NASA. So it's, not, it's got really got nothing to do with competing with NASA. It's really just about what do we need to do to have an exciting, inspiring future in space. That, that's, that's what I think really matters. But at the end of the day, you didn't end up raising the, fund, the money to pay NASA to the mission. You ended right. up doing it, building your own company, and, and ideally to do it cheaper than governments could. Yeah. Um, the, <clears throat> I, so, so I was able to, to figure out how to get the cost of the spacecraft and the greenhouse and the communication system w way less than it normally would cost for such a thing. I got stuck on the rocket. Um, and I went to, to Russia three times to try to buy a couple of their biggest ICBMs. Um, uh, this is about, this is in 2001, late 2001 and 2002. Um, it was definitely an in, uh, interesting experience. Uh, and uh, I, I sort of got the feeling I could have bought the Nuke too, but <laughs> didn't, didn't want to go there. Um, and then when I, got, when I got back from the third trip to Russia, um, that, that's when I thought, okay, look, uh, even if we do, even if we buy these, these ICBMs from Russia, um, I, 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 thought I, I thought my initial supposition was wrong. Um, and so what, what I thought really was that we'd lost the world to explore, that we'd lost the world to push the, the boundary. And, and, and in retrospect, that was actually a very foolish error uh, because the United States is a nation of explorers. The United States is a distillation of the human spirit of exploration. Mm -hmm. It's ludicrous to, to, to actually, in retrospect, to have made such an assumption. Um, it, but people need to believe that it's possible and that it's not gonna, it's not gonna bankrupt them. It's not, they're not gonna have to give up something important like healthcare. Uh, you know, it's gotta be a, a cost that isn't gonna meaningfully affect their, their standard of living. And I think the United States would absolutely be super, super excited uh, about uh, sending people to Mars. And people, I think a lot of people really wish that that would occur. Anyway, so that was, um, that was what I uh, came to the conclusion of. And, and I thought, well, if, if we don't make a difference in the cost of the rocket or the transport system, it's all, it doesn't matter. Um, it, it's, it's not, like I said, it's not a question of will, it's a question of way. Mm. Um, and so that's when I came back and started uh, SpaceX. But when I started SpaceX, it wasn't with the perspective of like, oh, we'll just, you know, take over the world of, and, uh, with, with awesome rockets. I don't know what the frick I was doing. I was like clueless. Um, 
I, I thought the most likely outcome was that we would fail. And, and the first three rockets did fail, so. And you put all your money into it? Between Tesla, SpaceX, and SolarCity, all in, yeah. That wasn't the plan at the beginning, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> and Peter Thiel says we don't think big anymore. You must have interesting right. conversations with him about that. Uh, well, you know, Peter's been a big supporter, actually. So he's, uh, um, he, he invested in uh, SpaceX at a, at a very important time in 2008. Uh, before we reached orbit, so after our third failure, but before our first success. So, you know, big credit to Peter and um, uh, Luke Nosek and the other guys at, at Founders Fund, basically my, my, my buddies from PayPal. <laughs> my buddies from PayPal saved my butt, you know. It was really, really good. So. so let's talk about cars. Um, uh, Many, many in the audience may rec uh, recollect the uh, notorious New York Times review of the, uh, of the, of the Model S. Yes, exactly. <laughs> of the Model S um, uh, earlier this year. Yeah. And your uh, reaction to that review and the Times reaction to your reaction and, yeah. and, and the effect on your share price and on orders and all that. And without rehashing the review or the facts, I'd like you to just do post-mortem the entire experience. But wait, say, how, do I not do, how do I do a post-mortem without any facts well, or anything? Post-mortem, <laughs> post post-mortem your reaction okay. to the review and what, you know, put you on the couch and what would you do differently today having seen the way it all played out? Um, well, I think... Um, I think th there's one thing I didn't do, and maybe still should, which is to, to, to post the, the, the rebuttal to the rebuttal. Because I, I withheld that and, and waited for the public editor. I sent that information to the public editor, waited for her to do her sort of thing. And she came down kind of on the side of Tesla with respect to the fact that the, the article was an error, but, but disagreed on the motive. On the ethics? Yes. Um, and because um, you, you impugned both facts and ethics, I, I did, yes. Um, and and I, and I think it was I, I think it was a, I would call it a low grade uh, ethics violation, not, not like a big one. I don't think he thought he was doing anything particularly terrible, mm. uh, but I, I would call it a low grade low grade violation, and not 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 of the Jason Blair you know crazy fabrication variety, but I, I would call it a low grade. It, it, it was not in good faith. If it, 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 that, that, that's, that's, that's an important point. Um, and uh, and I, I probably should have posted that rebuttal to make that clear, but I didn't do it. That's what I regret. So the only change you would make is that the very last bit, the, the rebuttal that you wrote but that has not been published, you would get and it maybe out Maybe I should. You would get it out there. Yeah. So you would continue to use the same language in the same way in your I initial I don't think reaction. the language was inaccurate. I really don't. You've often, <laughs> you've often said that one of your management techniques, one of the secrets of your success, is that you listen to ne negative feedback. Yes. Was the Times Review not, didn't fall into the category of negative feedback? I have no problem with negative feedback. I have a problem with, nor do I have a problem with critical reviews. If I had a problem with critical reviews, I would spend all my time battling critical reviews. Mm. Um, there have been hundreds of, of negative articles, hundreds, and yet I've only spoken out a few times. I, I don't have a problem with critical reviews. I have a problem with false reviews. All right. Um, one of the technologies that you had to um, um, you know, basically developed to near perfection, or at least, or at least work on hardest was lithium batteries. Right. Um, for the electric cars are run on lithium batteries. Safety has always been an issue, accidents, etc. cetera. Um, recently, Boeing had uh, uh, fires with their lithium right. batteries, and the, and, the, and the Dreamliner is now out of service because of that. Um, you volunteered to help the Boeing executives, I guess, diagnose and redesign. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what they did wrong, what you would have done differently, and, and what do you think the, the, the future of you know, Boeing and others' airline batteries are going to be? Sure. Um, 
Well, first of all, on, on the Boeing front, I mean, obviously, even though SpaceX and Boeing compete on the space side, we have no competition on the commercial airliner side. Um, and some of the comments that I made about Boeing have somehow been interpreted as an attack on Boeing when it is, in fact, not an attack on Boeing. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the only reason I actually, uh, uh, I mean, the, the main reason I, I should say I offered to help was that there's a friend of mine, Richard Branson, who's, whose airline is suffering as a result of mm -hmm. this lithium ion fire. And he, he, he was mentioning that you know, he's losing hundreds of millions, his, or his airline is, um, as a result of this, this problem. And I said, well, I think we could probably help. And then he, so he said, oh, great. Well, let me connect you with the, the chief engineer um, at, of the 787. I said, cool. We're happy to help. So uh, you know, I provided some, some advice, and hopefully that'll be helpful. Um, and I said, we're also happy to actually do the solution, if you want. Um, and uh, they haven't taken us up on that offer. Um, but we're, we're happy to help either in an advisory capacity or, or to do the solution, whatever would result in the 787 getting back to flight sooner. Um, we're just trying to be you know, pr productive and helpful. So um, I mean, I think the, the, in, in the case of the battery, uh, Boeing doesn't have a ton of in-house battery expertise. Mm -hmm. So they, they outsourced the, the, the battery and then you had a whole bunch of kind of nested outsourcing, mm -hmm. where they outsourced the battery system, and then and then that got outsourced to another company, then to another company, and then to a whole bunch of other companies, and and you're like four layers deep before you actually got to um, any hardware, um, and so that resulted in I think in a kind of a breakdown of communication. Um, I mean, from an architectural standpoint, the the, the fundamental issue is that the uh, is that I I, th I think. Um, is that the, the cells are too big, the battery cells are too big, and the gaps between the, the battery cells are, are not big enough. Mm. Um, and the problem with a, with a big battery cell is that the, the thermal pathway is, is, in a worst case scenario, is very long. Mm. So you have to say, well, if there's a hot spot in the battery, can it get its heat out? Yeah. Uh, and if it's deep in a cell, it can't, it can't do that. Mm. Um, and it's also hard to thermally condition the cells. Um, the, the life of the pack will be will be dependent upon on the temperature, the average not, not the average temperature, but the worst temperature at any point in any cell. So you want to really even that temperature out. That's why Tesla is a fan of having lots of small cells, um, and then actively cooling each cell to keep the temperature even, um, and make sure that if 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 um, hotspot does develop, it's a very short pathway to the cooling system, and it, and, and it can. You know, take care of it. And you also want to make sure that it's. it's I'm mean, getting quite technical here. Sorry. Mm. Um, it's it, it's um, passive propagation proof. So so if, if you, even if your active cooling system fails um, and you get thermal runaway in, in a cell, that thermal runaway event can't cascade into a neighboring cell. Right. So right. and you get the thermal dom domino effect. Right. I mean, it's it's not it's not super complicated. Um, so so. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it just, it, if, if you have big cells, you want big gaps, and ideally you, want, you don't want big cells, but if you do, you want big gaps, small cells, small gaps, yeah, I mean. So, I mean, this is, this is really important because, because um, the whole thing about this new generation of airplanes is that they're light. They use composites, they use electronics rather than mechanical right. systems, and so electricity drives the whole thing. So basically, my understanding is that you need lithium batteries in the sky. It just doesn't work any other way. And your point is it can be done. Oh, it totally can be done. Yeah. Like, lithium's getting a bit of a bad name here. Um, mm -hmm. Lithium is obviously the way to go. I mean, people have lithium ion batteries in their cell phones and their laptops. I mean, I don't think anyone's panicking here with the fact that they've got a lithium ion battery, in, you know, next to a sensitive region, of probably, of their body, you know? <laughs> Got it. Well, so just staying on, on, on power for one last set of questions before we, um, well, before I return to you, your life, which seems insane. Um, it is insane. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're also a chairman of uh, SolarCity, yeah. um, which I believe is America's largest solar installer. Um, you know, so space, transportation, energy, just picking off the big ones there. <laughs> All um, right. Now, you know, solar got a bad name over the last few years because of the cylinder meltdown, et cetera. But yeah. you know, my sense is that people are not differentiating between the making of solar cells and the using of solar cells. Right. And, and the Chinese competition and the glutting of the market on the supply side is what, Solyndra, what got Solyndra in trouble. They couldn't yeah. compete with the falling prices. But you're a consumer of solar cells. Right. 
So how do you see, you know, the Chinese, Chinese competition and sort of the glut of solar, of, of solar cells on the market? What does that do to you? Uh, I mean, I think what China's doing in the solar panel arena is awesome because they're lowering the cost mm. of solar power for the world. And they have these huge gigafactories that they created out in the, in the Chinese desert um, and with, with a ton of funding from the Chinese government. So it's like a giant donation from the tiny Chinese government, like, thanks, that's awesome, you know? Um, and, uh, uh, you know, people sort of complain about Solyndra, but, I mean, obviously anyone who's been, been involved in the venture world knows that you don't bet a thousand. There's some companies that die. The only reason we know about Solyndra is because it became a political football. Right. Um, and, uh, I mean, there, there are other solar panel manufacturers that are still doing reasonably well. Um, but, but, but it is tough when you're competing. Um, I mean, I think a good rule of thumb was don't, is, is don't compete with China in, with a commodity product. Yeah. Um, you know, you're really asking for, for trouble in that, in that scenario. Um, and, and, the, and it's really super easy to make 15% efficient or standard efficiency solar panels. It's super easy. It's like easier than making freaking drywall at this point. Um, wow. So it's like, does anybody think we should be competing with China in drywall manufacturing? Okay, probably not. So, um, so, so that's the thing. So, so and, and, and the, 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 the hard part of solar power is not the panel. It, it's actually the whole system. Mm -hmm. It's basically designing something that's going to fit on a particular rooftop because all you have all these heterogeneous rooftops. Right. Um, you've, then you've got to you've got to mount the system. You've got to wire it up. You've got to connect it with the inverters, connect it to the grid. You've got to do all the permitting. I mean, it's a bunch of like thorny, unglamorous, mm. stupid problems. But if somebody doesn't optimize them, they're still going to cost a ton of money. Right. Um, and, and, and a lot of them are really not, they're not fun problems. To, they're not, you know, exciting problems to, to, to optimize, but, but, but they are the problems that actually matter in the cost of, of solar power. So it's, uh, it's really more like, you know, like a, like a roofing contractor than it is a yeah. semiconductor company. I mean, what, what you're doing is you're putting a second roof on a building. Yeah. Okay, so, and, and you've got to do it at scale. And then you've got to manage all these systems because there's still some, I mean, even though the after-sales service is small, when you've got like hundreds of thousands of systems, that's still a lot to manage. Um, and, and so what, what Solar City really is, is a giant distributed utility. Um, and it's working in partnership with the, the house and business um, and in competition with the, the, the big sort of monopoly utility. I mean, I think it's like literally power to the people, okay? <laughs> it's like, <Yeah. laughs> it's li literally. So I think it's really awesome because utilities just never had any competition before. Yeah. Um, and, and now they're like, they have to actually think about the cost of power and figure out better ways to do it and that kind of thing. I think it's really great. Um, and, and the credit there is really due to Lynn and Peter Rive, co-founders. Uh, I mean, I throw in a few ideas every now and then, but mostly it's just about showing up the, at the board meeting to hear the good news. It's, 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 those guys are just doing such an awesome job. So, so you are CEO and CTO of SpaceX, so not just running the company, but you're actually chief technology officer yeah, as well. Yeah. You are CEO and chief product designer for Tesla, so not just running the company, but designing the cars. Yeah. And you're chairman of Solar City. Right. W what is your life like? It, it's, it's very busy. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'd actually like to take it down just a scooch, honestly. Um, because there, there are all these, I mean, these, these things that the last few years have been really, really great. Um, but then there were a number of years that sucked horribly. Um, and uh, I'd like to just not have it be so extreme. Um, uh, and like last year was a year of, of great achievement. But honestly, I didn't have that much fun. It sucked. I didn't have that much fun. Um, my New Year's resolution was to have a little bit more fun this year. So hey, I'm at South by Southwest, you know? <laughs> and you have five children. I do. They're awesome. Kids are awesome, by the way. You guys should all have kids. <laughs> kids are great. <laughs> uh, How much do you see them? I, I don't see them enough, actually. Uh, but. But I, uh, uh, what, what I find is that I'm able to be with them and uh, still be on email, because I don't need like, constant interaction except when we're talking directly. So um, I find I can be with them and still be 
you know, working at the same time. Um, but wait, I, wait, wait, are you saying you can do email while you're with your children? Yeah, absolutely, sure. Um, wow. I mean, not all the time, but a lot of the time. Um, that's, that, that's why it's handy to have a phone. You, you can sort of you do email in, in interstitial moments. Um, in the absence of that, I would not be able to get my job done. Wow, that's uh, impressive. Um, we are... <laughs> I have five children. I can't do email while I'm with my children. It's not yeah. good for the children, and it's really not good for the email. Well, I, I, I do have to have a nanny there. Otherwise, they'll kill each other. Uh, so um, yeah. Um, we are going to turn to audience questions at this point. Um, just a reminder that um, if you tweet your questions, hashtag AskMusk, there's a team in the back that will be selecting the um, other ones that uh, we haven't already covered and seem interesting. And I get them in front. Maybe you can see them as well. So I'll ask the first one from David Solis. Um, he asks, when it comes to researching, analyzing entrepreneurial opportunity, how do you go about qualifying or legitimizing, presumably, the idea? Sure. <clears throat> um, well, uh, I'm not sure I'm the best guide here, because the things that I've chosen have not been um, I've not been trying to optimize on a risk-adjusted return basis. Mm. So there are, uh, like, I, I would not say that I went to the rocket business, the car business, uh, or the solar business thinking that it's a, it's a great opportunity. I just thought that, that something needed to be done in, in these uh, industries in order to make a difference, and that's why I did it. So, um, but, but in general, I do think it's worth thinking about like, wh what you, whether what you're doing is going to result in disruptive change or not. If it's just incremental, it's unlikely to, to be something major. It, it's it's got to be something that's substantially better than, than what's gone on before. That cues up our next question really well. Um, this is from uh, Craig Lagris. Le um, Space, automotive, finance, energy, you've disrupted major industries. What would you do if you had a free reign over education? Um, well, I, th I think that the way that we currently do education is, is, is wrong. And, and we're, we're, when you see something like the Khan Academy and so forth, I think that's probably going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. I mean, generally, you want education to be like as close to a, a video game as possible, like a good video game. Like, you do not need to tell your kid to play video games. They will play video games on autopilot all day. <laughs> so if you can make it interactive and engaging, uh, then, then you can make education far more compelling and, and far easier to do. Um, so th I think that's how it should be. And it shouldn't be that you've got like these grades where people move in lockstep. Um, and so everyone goes through, you know, goes like normally, you know, will go through English, math, uh, science and so forth from like fifth grade to sixth grade to seventh grade like it's an assembly line. Uh, but, but people are not objects on an assembly line. That's a ridiculous notion. Um, people learn and are interested in different things at different paces. So you really want to um, disconnect the whole grade level th thing from the, the subjects. Allow people to progress at the fastest pace that they can or are interested in in each subject. Um, it seems like a really obvious thing. Um, I mean, I think like most teaching today is, is a lot like Bordville, where, um, and, and, it's, and, and as a result, it's just not, not that compelling. It's like somebody st standing up there and, and lecturing to you, mm -hmm. and they've done the same lecture several years in a row. They're not necessarily all that engaged or, or in, in doing it. Um, and you compare that to, say, Batman the Dark Knight, OK? Um, you know, and, and then you've got like the world's best special effects. You've got the world's best director, screenwriter, multiple cuts, um, amazing, you know, editing, and, um, and 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 that's amazing. But but like, imagine if instead you had like the local town um, aspiring actor do uh, the a, a one-person play version of that. Yeah, that would not be compelling. Yeah. <laughs> do Do you agree with Peter Thiel about uh, the unnecessariness of um, university, higher education? Uh, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, definitely, I, I do agree with Peter's uh, uh, point that um, a university education is often unnecessary. Um, th that's not to say it's unnecessary for, for all people, but um, 
I, I think you probably learn about as much, or, or, or the vast majority of what you're going to learn there in the first two years, and most of it is from your classmates. Mm. Um, because you can always buy the textbooks and just read them. Like, nobody's stopping you from doing that. Or go um, online. Or go online. Yeah. Um, so uh, now, now, for a lot of companies, they, 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 they do want to see the completion of the degree, because mm. they're looking for um, someone who's going to persevere and see it through to the end. And, and that's actually what, what, what's important to them. So it really depends on, on what somebody's goal is. If the goal is to start a company, I would say no point in finishing uh, college. Mm. Um, in, in my case, I had to. Otherwise, I'd get kicked out of the country. Yeah. Um, so uh, th that was important. But Although you um, went on and got a master's degree as well, right? Um, I, I, I came out to Silicon Valley to do a PhD at Stanford in applied physics and material science mm. to work on um, ultra capacitors for use in electric cars. And that's what I was going to do. And then I decided to put that on hold to start a company. But since I already had my under undergrad, I could then get an H-1B visa and that kind of thing. So the H-1B visa requires uh, a degree. Um, but other than that, I, I, I would have, if what, that wasn't the case, I probably would have st uh, stopped education sooner. Did you not go to Wharton for? Yeah, yeah. I did du dual undergrad in physics and, I, and, and business at Wharton. I see. Yeah, but it was undergrad, not, not master's. Un understood. Yeah. Um, another question from the audience from Dan Griffiths. Um, fill in the blank. You will be disappointed if blank does not happen in your lifetime. Um, well, probably the, the, the most thing I've just pointed out is if, if humanity doesn't land on Mars in my lifetime, I'd be really disappointed. That would be, you know, that, that would probably be my biggest disappointment. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, I think that's the, the thing I'm most concerned about. Because we're at this, I mean, obviously that's what SpaceX is working on. Um, so I'm not trying to be self-serving here, but it's just, I kind of worry that we've hit this. If, I, I don't know whether our technology level will keep going or subside. Mm. And for the first time in four and a half billion years, the technology level is at the point where we can extend life to another planet, make life multiplanetary. And um, I, I think it's too easy to take for granted that it's going to stay above that level. Um, and if it doesn't, and if it falls below that, will it return? Who, who knows? Mm. Um, uh, you, you know, the, the, the sun is gradually expanding, and in about you know, roughly 500 million years, maybe a billion years at the outside, um, uh, the, the oceans will boil, and, and there will be no, no meaningful life on Earth. I mean, it might be like some you know, chemotrophs or, or, or ultra-high temperature bacteria or something, but nothing that can make a spaceship. Um, <laughs> and, and that's, like, if you think of, like, maybe it's a 500 million year, t year time frame, that's only a 10% increase in the life of lifespan of Earth. So if, if, if um, humanity had taken an extra 10% longer to get here, it wouldn't have gotten here at all. Yeah. Um, and so far, we haven't seen any signs of life from other worlds that we, have, we haven't detected anything. I hope, you know, hopefully we do, and hopefully it's not a warship coming towards us. Um, uh, but uh, I, I just think th th that's the thing that really concerns me. We, 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 we need to get this done, um, and, and then that is the, the best thing we can do to ensure the continued existence of humanity. Um, so that's why I, I would say that's the most important thing. Do you personally? Do you, do you personally want to step foot on Mars? I, I do personally want to step foot on Mars. Um, but honestly, I would be doing this even if there was no, even if I knew there was no chance of me going to Mars. But it, because I think, like I said, I think it's just important that we, we, we are on a path to getting there. Um, so um, I, I, I would like to go at some point. I'll, I'll go if I'm certain that SpaceX will be fine without me um, and, that, and that path will continue. Because um, uh, you may have heard me uh, some people may have heard the joke I've made before, which is like, you know, I, 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 w I would, I think be, I would like to die on Mars, just not on impact, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so. <laughs> uh, another question uh, from the um, audience. So we just, we just lost, lost that one. There was like, I don't remember um, who would ask this question, but the question was, um, 
uh, wh which, um, when, when, in, in, which do you think is going to have more impact on the world, SpaceX or Tesla? Well, I, I think if we look back, or if historians, if I if were to look back on the impact of Tesla you know, many years from now, I think uh, it would be that Tesla, hopefully, that Tesla advanced the advent of sustainable transport by something like a decade, maybe, maybe two decades. Mm. Um, but I, I do think electric cars are inevitable. In fact, I think all modes of transport will go fully electric with the ironic exception of rockets. Um, and, so that's, uh, that's what I think. T and, and then for, for Solar City, perhaps something similar uh, on the energy production side, sustainable energy production. Then uh, for SpaceX, hopefully SpaceX develop, develops the technology necessary to transport large numbers of people and cargo to Mars. Um, and um, I mean, I think that's uh, you know a, a bigger impact. But or rather, the what what Solar City and, and Tesla are about are solving what I think is the most pressing terrestrial concern, mm -hmm. which is the sustainable production and consumption of energy, or helping solve it. I mean, there are many people solving it. Um, and then what SpaceX is about is uh, helping solve the biggest non-terrestrial problem, which is the extension of life beyond Earth. So th those are how I see it. We have two related questions, one that's no longer on the screen, but, uh, and, and another one that is. Um, the, the first was, what was the best advice you ever got? And the second, and you maybe can join them in, in your answer, is you, you mentioned working with your friends Peter Thiel and Richard Branson. Who influences and inspires you? Sure. Um, well, I, I'm inspired by a lot of historical figures. Like one of my favorite guys is Ben Franklin. You know, I just think he's, you know, he, he's a really good guy. I mean, he was a scientist, and he also, I mean, worked in um, obviously publishing and the political sphere. But he kind of like. He just thought about like what are the what are the problems that need to get solved and, and worked on those. Um, and he just a, seemed like a good guy all around. Um, so really, uh, I like him, and um, and I like just the historical figures like in, in science and um, literature. And I mean, uh, I'm a huge fan of Churchill um, and uh, and obviously like Tesla. We named Tesla after Nikola Tesla, better than Musk Motors, you know. Um, and I mean, I've actually, I haven't named any product or company after myself, uh, but but that maybe gives a sense of like a, I think like Tesla is someone who deserves a lot of recognition. Um, and uh, sorry, what was well, the? They're, well, they're all dead. Yeah, uh, they're any any they're living dead. figures? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think um, there's a friend of mine, uh, Larry Page. I, I think mm -hmm. what Larry's doing uh, and, and Sergey at, at Google. I'm. Um, Really admire what, what they've done. Um, I think uh, obviously he's recently dead, but Steve Jobs, who doesn't admire Steve Jobs? Um, I think Jeff Bezos is doing some, some great things, and among others, competing with you. Uh, yes, but that's a good thing. In fact, every time I see Jeff Bezos, I say, "Why aren't you doing more in space?" Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the other half of the question was the best advice you ever got. Best advice I ever got. Um, well, I, I think the uh, you know the physics training is a very good training, mm. where uh, it's a good framework for reasoning. Where you, you're trained to think about first principles and reason from there, and that means boiling things down to the most fundamental truths, and then connecting those truths in a way to to try to understand how reality is. Because you know physics has this problem where they're trying to figure out things that are totally counterintuitive, yeah. and so they had to have a framework for, for for getting there. Like quantum mechanics is incredibly counterintuitive, yeah. uh, but it's true. Um, and so you had so, so physics developed a framework for for figuring out uh, things that aren't obvious, and that's why I think it's it's not, it's it's a lot of advice, but it's 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 the right framework. Um, and then um, you know just in general, critical thinking is is good. You know, examining whether you, you have the correct axioms or the most applicable axioms. Uh, does the logic necessarily connect? Um, and then, what are the what are the range of probable outcomes? Um, outcomes are usually not deterministic. They're mm. they're they're a range. Mm. Um, and so you want to 
figure out what those prob probabilities are, and make sure, ideally, that you're the house. <laughs> you know, it's, it's fine to take, it's, fi it's, fine to, it's fine to gamble as long as you're the house. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and the, uh, a subset of that is, is to, to um, listen to critical feedback, which you alluded to uh, earlier. Always solicit critical feedback, particularly from friends. Um, because generally, they will be thinking it, but they won't tell you. Yeah. Um, a question here um, from Agile Zachance. Um, any news or development on your Hyperloop idea? And you might explain what your Hyperloop idea is. <laughs> well, um, what I've said is that I'm, I'm putting the Hyperloop stuff on hold until I get Tesla to profitability. Yes. Uh, because I think if I was an investor in Tesla, and they heard me sort of spouting off about the Hyperloop before I got the company profitable. They were like, hey, you know, go, go, do, go do your job. <laughs> so that's what I'm doing. Um, I think once Tesla is in a, in a, has been profitable maybe for at least for a quarter, maybe two quarters, then I'll, I'll talk about the Hyperloop. Um, but I think it could be an interesting way to, uh, I mean, I think it would be an interesting way to travel really quickly from one city to the next. You quickly explain just in one sense what a Hyperloop is. <laughs> Well, um, it, it would be something that would be, I'd say, twice as fast as a plane, at least in terms of total transit time, um, maybe a little faster. Uh, it would be immune to weather, uh, incapable of crashing, um, pretty much, unless there's like a terrorist attack. Um, and um, the ticket price would be like, let's say, half that of a plane. Um, so it would be better in every way. Um, train of some sort, though. It's kind of, it's, it's, it's not exactly a train. It would, be a it would be a new mode of transportation that doesn't currently exist. Terrestrial. Terrestrial, yeah. OK, underground, above ground? Could go either. A kind of yeah. subway, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think it's, I think it's it, the capital cost would be less if it's mostly above ground. But you can go underground, too. All right. <laughs> Maybe last question. Um, what's the biggest mistake you've ever made? And this is from uh, Lexi Hill. What's the biggest mistake you've ever made, and how did you move forward? Looking back, was it really that big a deal? Biggest mistake. Mm. I've made lots of mistakes. Some of them, some are pretty big. Um, um, I mean, it's hard to say, because things have worked out pretty well in the end. So how, how big of a mistake could it have been, as the, yeah. as the question is really, really asking. Um, uh, you know, I did lots of dumb things at my first company and at PayPal. Um, and uh, you know, I, I, think, I think sometimes, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. There, there's so many. I like, oh, I'm hard pressed to say this is, this is the biggest one. You know, give us one or two. Okay. <laughs> um, personal. Oh, okay, sure. Um, so, th there. Th the biggest mistake in general that I've made, and I'm trying to correct for that, is uh, to put too much of a weighting on somebody's talent and not enough on their personality. Mm. Um, and I've made that mistake several times. In fact, I, then I'd say, oh, gee, I'm, I'm not going to make that mistake again, and then I would make it again. Um, and, and I think it, it actually matters uh, whether somebody has a good heart. It really does. And, and I've, made the, I've made the mistake of thinking that sometimes it's just about the brain. On that heartfelt note, we're done. Thank, please join me in thanking Elon Musk. Thank you.